get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the second uh, EU circular talk on the role of cities uh, to boost the circularity of the food systems. This talk has been organized by University of Turin, Italy, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, and the Institute of Innovation and Responsible Development, INNOVO with all the collaboration of the uh, members of the leadership group uh, on food waste, food system, and bioeconomy. I'm Paola De Bernardi, professor of uh, circular economy management at University of Turin. And with my colleagues, Simona Grande and Giacomo Pettenati, we have the great pleasure of moderating this talk. A great welcome to all our distinguished speaker and to all our participants. But before officially starting the first session, and why people are slowly entering the event, please allow me to remind you a few meeting rules. Please use the chat function to say who you are, what is your affiliation, and from where you are joining us. We are recording the event, which will be available on the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform website in a few days. Finally, feel free to engage with us asking questions using the chat, so writing down your question. We will answer to you as soon as we can, but in the final section of the talk on discussion and final remarks. So I'm very delighted to introduce the first session of the opening remarks with the Mr. Peter Schmidt, President of the Agriculture, Rural Development and the Environment Section at the European Economics and Social Committee. Then we will have Emma Chow uh, from the LM MacArthur Foundation, uh, where she leads the Food Initiative. And fine, um, last but not least, uh, Ander E. Zagir, a Junior Analyst of the OECD. So let's get started. For me, it's a great, great pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Schmidt. Please, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm really delighted to, to, to open this, uh, this today's uh, new circular uh, talks. Uh, it is a quite important topic, what you, what you discuss uh, uh, here, and um, give you a couple of ideas uh, what the role of the ESCU is and was, and this could, how this could tie into the debate. Uh, which we're going to have uh, uh, this uh, uh, today, but let me start it first uh, with an with a clear statement, which is in these days I think necessary to to stress. Um, when we talk about food and food supply chains and the functioning of 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 the food supply chain, so we have a lot of complaints. No? So we we know what doesn't work, what should work better. But when we are really honest with us, then we must really say that during the, this crisis, the only really functioning, working of a, of a supply chain was the food, was the, was the food supply chain. We must be honest on that. So that's, these, are, these, are the, these are good news, no? that we must say we had almost every day in the shelves of the supermarkets or wells on the markets food during this crisis. I think this is a, this is a statement which we should, should not, not, not forget. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, uh, we as ESC, I was a rapporteur on different, on different opinions in the last years, already 2016, 16, we started a debate that we need in Europe a comprehensive food policy. We need a an, an holistic approach uh, in, the food, in the food supply chain because we have a lot, of, a lot of weaknesses and we must overcome this in order to have sustainable food systems um, in, in, in Europe. So, this is today now the farm to fork strategy. Whether it is a real strategy, we could have a debate on that, but the, the commission picked that up. And in this uh, opinion, we highlighted already some, some necessary steps. I described it as, as a kind of, kind of temple where you could see as, as a roof with the food policy, the different pillars are uh, that is education is healthy diets. It is about transport. It is about urban food policy it is about rural development and uh, the basement of this temple is the is governance so what we have missed in the past was governance so we had different policies a lot of different policies in europe but there was no real government between the, uh, the dgs by the way the same the same in the in the in the in the, in the member states so and 
when we when we go consequently in a comprehensive food policy, we go of course when we end on the local level and the urban level in order to shape policy. So there are there are there are a lot of initiatives for urban food policies and 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 they're, they're, they're good and encouraging initiatives. We must we must foster not at least uh, from the urban. Um, you know, the, the 2015 from the Milan uh, Urban Food Policy uh, Pact. So, uh, so we see the ne the, the needs uh, to have these uh, talks like today, because this is about. So the question is how we can we can achieve this uh, comprehensive food policy. And there are some there are some tools I think we should we should use. The one is is circularity. So we start we must start defining what it means talking about circularity in the food sector. So that, this is different uh, to other sectors. So that's why it's so, so we are so happy that we could launch as ESC together with the commission, uh, the uh, European Economic uh, um, um, Stakeholder Platform. Um, so we drive this together, have a look at the website. You see a lot of initiatives, a lot of ideas, a lot of good practices. So bringing all the, 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 actors, uh, the actors together, so using, this tool uh, in order to come to a circular sustainable uh, food system. Second tool is, as we already proposed, and we are not that happy that the commission is not taking it up, we proposed an, we proposed an European, uh, European Policy Food Council. So, and this must be mirrored in the on the national level and it should be mirrored on the local level. So if we would have this kind of food policy councils across Europe, in the member states, on the local or in rural areas, and in the on urban, in the urban um, 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 le level, so we could shape and organize sustainable local food supply change, which are which are um, uh, in the end uh, circular. So, and that's why these talks like today are so important. And I'm happy to listen today to you, to to the experience of the different stakeholders of the different participants in order to bring our experience and your experience also to the European Economic and Social Committee. Wish you all, wish us all a great day and uh, happy to be here. Back to you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your very interesting suggestions. And uh, now I give the floor, the, the moderating role to Simona. Thank you very much, Paula and Dr. Schmidt, for uh, these important reflections on the meaning of this topic and uh, this kind of meetings also during this very particular moment we are living. Uh, welcome to our audience, also from my side. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure and extreme honor to be here today as a moderator of this EU Circular Talk. Now we will continue with uh, Emma Chow. Emma serves as, as the project lead on the food initiative at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Emma and her team bring together major industry players from across the food value chain, along with city municipalities, to take a systemic approach to unlock the powerful positive potential of the food system. Emma has prepared a video message for our audience to share some insights on this. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Chow and I lead the Food Initiative at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And today we're talking all about the opportunities for cities to play a really critical role in helping to shift to food systems that are regenerative by design and ones that embed circular economy principles in their very design and functioning. So let's dive right in. Some of you may be wondering who the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is. And to answer that question, our sole mission is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And so we do that by working across several different areas, including food. And what we're looking at here is investigating and understanding what we call the linear economy. So this is today's current economy. It's a take, make, waste system. And it simply isn't going to work long term. It's wasteful, it's degrading, and it's just not good for people, for nature, or for business. So we need to fundamentally rethink 
the economy. And what we can see is across different sectors, including food, this linear nature. So this is from our analysis conducted over the course of 2018 and published in the Cities and Circular Economy for Food report, which is available on our website, which shows we're taking these massive volumes of finite resources and destroying our soils, which are also finite, to produce food. And then we are as we move along that food journey, a lot of the food is unnecessarily going to waste. And you can see all that see that in the peel off arrows along the journey. Most of the food today already ends up in cities. And so much of it ends up going wasted if it's an edible fraction. But also there's a huge volume of the inedible fraction accumulating, for instance, as the organic waste that totals about 2.8 billion tons annually accumulating in cities. Unfortunately, less than 2% of this volume of organic waste piling up in our urban centers around the world each year is actually getting collected and turned into um, valuable uses within the food and the broader bioeconomy and keeping those materials in use at their highest value. So there's a big opportunity to be rethinking the system so that we're no longer seeing this huge linear nature. And so this linear system has costs for society. What we see is the costs are about one for every one dollar that we're spending on food, there's about two dollars worth of cost to society. These are split up. What we find in our work, it's split between consumption costs, things like obesity, hunger, micronutrient deficiency, and what's often overlooked, which are the costs of production. So this is how we produce our food, how we grow our food, how we manage the waste and byproducts. That has big implications on our health, environment, and economy. So today we're creating these huge costs because of the linear nature of the food system. So it's clear that we need to fundamentally rethink it. And that's where circular economy offers a solutions framework. So we can rethink systems by looking at these three principles of the circular economy. The circular economy is built on these principles, which are all driven by design. It's about eliminating waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use at their highest value, and importantly, regenerating natural systems. So what does it look like to translate these principles, which can be applied across all industries, specifically to food? This is the question we investigated as part of our work on cities and food. And what we landed on are three ambition areas that cities can undertake. So one is about leveraging the sheer demand power that cities have. About 80% of the world's food is expected to be landing up and landing in cities by 2050. So that, that's massive, right? And so cities can use this demand power to actually be stimulating positive benefits and impacts at the production, at the farm level, which may be near or far away from cities. And so cities can source food that's grown regeneratively to maximize those positive regenerative outcomes and locally where it's appropriate. Cities can also be making the most of food. But, so rather than letting so much of it, as we do today, go wasted, whether edible or inedible byproducts, we can find solutions and innovate to make the most of all the food we grow and all the food that lands up in cities, whether it's preventing edible food that shouldn't go to waste in the first place, or taking the byproducts, the pieces that we can't eat, and actually turning it into valuable materials that can continue to circulate throughout the economy, whether it's within food or beyond. And then finally, we can design and market healthier food products products that are not only healthy for us and our nutrition, our bodies, but also for, for nature too. And so this is really getting into the large volume of food that is transformed, it's designed from those raw ingredients into the products that we reach for in grocery store shelves, or the meals that we order from our take favorite takeaway shops. All of these foods, have designers behind them in the background who are making decisions, intentional decisions that influence 
impacts that radiate throughout the system. So it's about how do we make smart choices so that we're designing food for a regenerative system in that design stage. So this is the vision of a circular economy for food that we painted specifically for cities in a report that we published in 2019. And as part of our findings, our analysis, we found that if cities around the world take these take action in these three ambition areas at scale by 2050 we can expect about 2.7 trillion dollars worth of benefits for society and this is cut across economic benefits health benefits and environmental benefits and if you want to drill more into these findings into the vision what it all means what i very briefly just spoke about i do encourage you to check out our cities and circular economy for food report which is totally available on our website. And if you want to look specifically, do a double click specifically into the climate side of things, do check out our Completing the Picture paper, which was also published in 2019. Um, one of the sectors that we focus on is food and agriculture. So it's not necessarily a specific city's angle, but you can get um, an in-depth analysis and some great takeaways about the, the power of food to actually be a really critical part of our climate solution. Now, we have been actioning or trying to bring to life this vision um, with a group of cross-sector stakeholders over the past few years since we launched the food initiative in June of 2019 after publishing these materials. So let's just talk about how we've been doing that. We are working with a group of companies from across the food industry, and you can see quite a good representation there on the screen, and also philanthropic partners too. So these players make up our advisory board and have been on board for the duration of our food work since 2019. And we also have been working with cities. So when we launched the initiative, we invited cities around the world to apply to become strategic partner cities. And we have three of them. So we have Sao Paulo, London, and New York, who we selected as really committed leaders in the space who want to embed the principles of circular economy and, and really bring that vision to life and accelerate. Um, its realization in these places. So we've been working hard over these past couple of years to develop um, strong relationships, not just with the city agencies who are relevant, but also with local consortium. So these are made up of farmers and farming groups in the region, companies, big and small, lots of innovators, but also multinationals involved alike. Um, other NGOs or initiatives, organizations who are really active and important parts of the ecosystem in these cities. So it's about boosting up and building on the great work that's already underway in these cities, and then carving out new opportunities that can be seized and leveraging EMFs convening and thought leadership capabilities. So I want to give a few stories, a few real world examples, just to um, shine a light on some of the things underway. So I'll share with you one from each of the cities that we're working most closely with. One of them starting with Sao Paulo is called Connect the Dots. And if you haven't heard about this, this is a program led by the city and something we've fed into as part of our um, supporting demonstration work. So there's about 40 consortium members in, um, involved in our Sao Paulo work, and some of them are directly engaging on Connect the Dots with the city. And you can see here, very literally is about connecting all of these different players. So going from the producers and really a strong focus on smallholder farmers and the outcomes, the goals that the city and, and region is driving towards is um, protecting and preserving watersheds in the region and also biodiversity. So those are two of the key environmental outcomes that we're working towards. 
And so, of course, the farmers in the region have a big impact on both of those dimensions. In order to support these farmers, it's not just about local capacity building and um, providing technical assistance to these farmers, but also leveraging the demand side of things. So looking at how, for instance, can the school food system and public procurement of about 2.5 million meals a day actually help to stimulate the demand and source ingredients, produce, for instance, from these local smallholder farmers. And at the same time, how can organic waste streams in the city, which is a very large volume, um, be collected and turned into valuable organic fertilizers or compost? So that's something that Green Plat, which is a local innovator, is using a digital platform to map the hubs or hot zones of organic waste flows in the city and actually capture and turn into products to go back out to the farmers. So a really great example of stimulating and activating this local ecosystem of the very diverse players who need to be involved. So going from Sao Paulo to a completely different region, going to London, I just want to highlight here some of the work that um, one of the city agencies, ReLondon, is doing really with a focus on disruptive innovation and innovators who can come in, disrupt the markets, um, and really stimulate an acceleration of the innovation we need to realize a circular economy for food. So what you're seeing on the screen is a great range across food waste prevention, food surplus reuse, and food waste upcycling and recycling, a series of um, leading innovators who the city is um, supporting through ReLondon's activities. And th these are really critical in not just accelerating the transition to a circular economy, but also um, providing economic opportunities, for instance, and in stimulating job growth um, in these regions. And one stat just to mention is how London it has a goal of doubling its clean economy by 2030. So this type of program and supporting innovators is a really important part of that journey. Finally, moving on to our last city is New York City. So again, a different region. And I wanted to highlight here something really exciting that very recently the mayor's office of food policy released the city's first ever 10 year food policy plan. And this is super comprehensive. I do encourage you to check this out because it's a great example of a city um, taking a comprehensive framework that's bringing together all different departments within the city to focus on how to create a more racially and economically equitable and also sustainable and healthy food system for all New Yorkers. And so of course, big challenges, but big opportunities here. Um, and there's five goals and 14 strategies that are under, underpinning this plan. So you can dig into all the details um, if you check it out on the website. And I, in terms of actions and things you can take away from today, I do want to highlight one resource that is particularly relevant for today's conversation, which is designed for cities, city agencies. Um, it's, a, it's a questionnaire. And so it's, we tried to make it as simple as possible. You can download it, you can print it off, you can go through. It's kind of like a magazine um, survey or quiz where you'll get a score at the end and you can see where you sit on the spectrum towards this vision of circular economy for food. And so you can download that. It's totally free and accessible. And it, we hope that it can help identify the top opportunities that you as a city can um, double click into and, and really focus in the near term, um, the solution making. So I hope this has been a helpful discussion to help you understand what is circular economy? How does it apply to food? What is the work that we've been doing with cities to really shine a light on the really important role they play as catalysts? And then one practical tool to um, get your hands a bit dirty after today's session. So thanks a lot for your time and hope you uh, take, play your part in um, creating a circular economy for food in your city. Thank you.
Thanks again to Emma Chow. It's uh, great to learn more about the great work of such a circular economy pioneering organization as EMF uh, and what they're doing on this very important topic and its ambitions and vision for accelerating the much needed transition and transformation of our food system and cities around the world. We highly encourage you to have a look at the material and best practices she mentioned to know more. Uh, now we continue our talk with uh, Ander Esaguirre. Ander is a policy analyst within the OECD Water Governance and Circular Economy Unit, Cities, Urban Policies and Sustainable Development Division. He contributed to policy dialogues on the circular economy and water at national and subnational levels in Sweden, the Netherlands, Spain, and Glasgow, among others. He's also one of the authors of the recent OECD report on the circular economy in cities and regions. Welcome, Ander, on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona and Paola, for, for the invitation. So I will try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, yes. perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ander Aguirre, and I work as a policy analyst at the OECD program on the circular economy in cities and regions. Um, for those who are not uh, familiar with the OECD, uh, it is an intergovernmental organization of 38 uh, member countries. And what we do is uh, on this program is mainly to, to support cities and regions in their, in their transition towards the circular economy. So we work with governments, uh, we support local and regional governments. As you can see here in the slide, we have worked with cities in Sweden, in Spain, Netherlands. Uh, we are working with Glasgow, which is uh, uh, taking the floor uh, after in, 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 the following, um, in the following session. Um, we also organize uh, several networking events uh, on the circular economy, and I take the opportunity to invite you all to a, an event on, on the circular economy we organized with the G20 on circular cities uh, next uh, 12th of July, where we will discuss uh, and we will share the, the experience of some cities working with the food. And also we have in our program, we have uh, developed some, some tools to, to measure progress toward the circular economy in a, in a, subnational, in a subnational level. But Today, I would like to, to share with all of you uh, three main messages. And the first one is that cities are and will be major food, uh, food consumers. So that's why it's important to, to focus on, on the role of, of the cities today. We have seen in our, in our study, in a study we conducted last year, uh, which is based on the results of more than 50 uh, cities and regions, which analyzed the state of the art of the transition towards the circular economy in the, in the subnational level, that food is a, a key sector uh, for the most uh, circular economy strategies. So as mentioned by, by a colleague of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, 80% uh, of food will be consumed in cities by, by 2050. Also uh, a total of 2.9 billion tons are of food are annually destined to cities. And also uh, achieving a regenerative food system in cities uh, would entail uh, an annual reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 4.3 billion tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. So food is important in cities because cities consume, because cities produce food waste and because this regenerative system can have a really uh, can achieve several uh, positive consequences on the on the environment on the environmental point, point of view. So this leads me to to the second point, which is that the circle is not is yet not closed. Uh, so we are talking about a closing loop, but actually, what we saw in in our study is that only 37% of the existing initiatives, only 37% of the initiatives uh, were uh, already implemented, being most of them uh, under development and others uh, 
a plan or not plan to, 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 to be designed. So this means that there is still the potential to, to, to close this loop. And as mentioned before, almost two thirds of all the survey cities included food in, into their, their strategy. So what we saw also uh, is that cities are working uh, on the uh, are working on, on food and circular economy in 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 four uh, main main ways. The first one is that we saw that, uh, that there are cities that are pro promoting uh, local food uh, production. So, for instance, in Paris, uh, the city is planning to relocate part of its its food production to reduce the transport cost and the related, uh, the related emissions. Also, we, we, we saw that uh, there are some cities uh, setting up uh, different initiatives that aim, aim at reducing uh, food waste within uh, specific sectors, uh, such as the hospitality or, or food services or school canteens. So for instance, uh, the city of Umea, which is one of the cities we collaborated with, and one of the case studies of our program created a network of uh, restaurants to connect restaurants with local producers and which aim also to guide citizens uh, on the on sustainable uh, choices. And other options and other ways to, to work on, on food and circular economy in cities uh, detected was the redistribution of food and also the, the transformation uh, the transformation of organic organic and food waste into into new into new products. So, if I go to to the next slide, uh, what we saw is that even if there are initiatives, as we saw in in our work, there are there are there are some obstacles, and these obstacles are not very much related to the to to the technical. Uh, to the technical nature of, of, of the solutions. I mean, technical solutions exist and uh, are already in place. So we know how to transform uh, waste into resources, how to reduce the, the organic waste. The problem that we saw and that we detect is that the problem is to be able to achieve this. And, uh, and here, uh, ac according to, to our survey, we saw that the main, the main problems and the main obstacles are the lack and the insufficient financial resources and also uh, the inadequate regulatory framework and here uh, i'm I, I would like to support what we, it was mentioned by by, by peter in, in, in the statement that governance governance is is key to to work on a on a circular uh, food system so uh, it's true, for example, regarding regulatory frameworks, it's true that there is some work uh, in progress. Uh, France launched um, a national uh, law to, to tackle food waste. Also, Ireland has worked on that, and Spain is currently uh, designing uh, a, a, a law to, to tackle food waste. But however, we see that there are still some problems. For example, in Paris, the city I, I, I live, uh, organic waste collection is not is not compulsory, but, and what the city is doing is to start uh, creating some uh, pilot experiences in some of the neighborhoods to to start uh, doing this uh, organic waste collection. So, what what I want to say with this is that there, that there is still room to improve and uh, and to update the the regulation uh, to, to to move towards a, a circular food system and. My, my last uh, message here is that, uh, and you could notice because I was the, the, the whole presentation talking about a system, is that the solution is, is the system. It's not, we cannot work on food uh, in, a, in an isolated way in, in silos. So it's important that we look and we analyze all the different stages, stages of, the, of the system. So starting from the production of food, uh, continuing with the distribution, the consumption, and the, 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 the management of, of food waste. So it's important to take into consideration all these phases in, in, into the system. Here, what in our program, what we think it can be done is it can 
it can be done is to promote a circular economy system in the in the food sector it it can also be facilitated uh, the connection between actors uh, within this uh, circular food system and also it's important to to make sure that the enabling uh, governance conditions such as uh, regulation fi financial data and capacity can help uh, build this this uh, circular system so it is important that cities start thinking about uh, start thinking in a systemic way in a systemic way how all thinking about how all the phases that i just mentioned are included and belong to the same system because we are not just talking about the food waste we are talking about food and how food can be part of all the urban policies how it can be linked to other other policies of of the city like uh, water or, or energy so i would like to conclude saying this and highlighting the importance of uh, of thinking in a systemic way to build a circular food system in, in cities. So thank you, thank you very much for, for your attention. I leave here my 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 contact uh, for for any doubts you may have, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to Andre Seguire for uh, sharing such powerful and straightforward messages from OECD, providing us with a comprehensive overview. Uh, from the big picture to more local strategies and, and figures and the need for this uh, systemic approach. Uh, I have the pleasure to give now the word to my colleague Giacomo Petenati. Together we will moderate the next section of today's EU Circular Talk. Yes, thank you Simone. Simone, good morning everyone. I'm also very pleased to be here to contribute to this uh, very important event. And uh, we open now another section of this talk, which is based on four city case studies. And uh, we chose them because they are among the most relevant experiences of uh, circular economy initiatives concerning urban food systems. And they present us uh, a, a big variety of perspectives and approaches to this very, very broad and complex issue. Um, so let's start soon with the first contribution, which is a video from Oslo. Uh, by Cynthia Reynolds, and Cynthia is the founder of Circular Regions, uh, which is a data-driven, mission-oriented solution to accelerate circular economy in cities and regions uh, via systemic, place-based, multi-stakeholder innovations. And Cynthia will contribute to the talk with an insight of, the, of these really interesting platform initiatives. So thank you very much. Please, we can start the video. Oh, okay, sorry. Could you hear me? Yes. Hello, thank you for having me today. My name is Cynthia Reynolds and I am the founder and the systems architect behind the Circular Regions platform. Circular Regions is a nonprofit organization based in Norway whose aim is to develop projects that support social, economic and environmental impact through circular solutions. As you heard earlier from Anda with uh, the OECD, the OECD's Circular Economy in Cities and Regions program had a pilot and one of the original cities was in Umeå in Sweden. Umeå is a very forward-looking city. They had already assigned the resources to create a role for one person within the, the city to look at the regional perspective across all the different sectors. And so the next stage for them was to map out circular initiatives. What is already happening to be able to identify the gaps identify new synergies and learn from best practice. And that is where we came in. We were hired by the city of Umeå to come in and map out best practice because the circular regions platform is the digital infrastructure that can map any circular initiative from circular business models to policies and economic incentives, as well as educational and behavioral change resources. And we can map them on the life cycle uh, model that is based by the European Environment Agency's uh, framework for the circular economy, looking at materials, design, production, distribution, what's happening with consumption and stock, as well as within waste. And the way that we do this is to bridge top down and bottom up circular economy. How do we provide policymakers with the data they need to know from the bottom up initiatives actually walking the walk? And we do this through place-based solutions. We connect urban and rural communities across regions. 
and it's a multi-stakeholder solution to bring together the entire ecosystem. And we're mission oriented to empower individuals and organizations. But everything that we do is data driven with scalable systems. And we work through a growing network of systems entrepreneurs, building upon the work of the Skoll and the Rockefeller Foundations. These are individuals who activate the ecosystem. They're circular economy experts in regions around the world who work with municipalities and government, who work with industries and SMEs, and know the entire network of community organizations in a region, and they're able to activate the entire ecosystem. And we provide them with the tools, resources, and methodology to be able to do so. The circular economy, it's a gem with many facets. And depending on who you talk to, they may be discussing waste management, business development, urban planning, design. All these different facets need to work together, as do the stakeholders. I have often said that it's um, like asking someone to uh, describe the circular economy. It's, it's like asking a group of blind people to conceptualize an elephant. You have industry and business holding on to the legs saying, we're the pillars, we are going to move this economy. You have the public sector at local, regional and national levels holding on to the trunk saying, my role is to lead. I'm not really sure where I should be going, but this is my role. You have the NGOs and the third sector and community organizations holding on to the tail saying, don't leave without me, I'm a part of this. And then you have each and every one of us, you and I, we're, we're under the girth of this huge entity and we think, how can I understand the complexity of this? And so we bring together a holistic understanding of the circular economy, one that looks at the entire life cycle with all of the facets, looking at all of the loops within the circular economy, where the smallest loops create the biggest impact. And it operates at all levels, at the micro level, with you and I as users and consumers accessing products and services, the companies that we support in doing so, as well as the companies and organizations that we work for. It works at the meso level with clusters and networks and eco-industrial parks. And it also works at the macro level with cities, regions and nations developing policy and legislation, as well as economic incentives to accelerate it. But we're also incorporating social equity. This is a piece of the puzzle that is often omitted when discussing the circular economy. We often hear of environmental quality and economic prosperity, but social equity is vital. And how do we do this? People often say, what is the circular economy? Well, it's really quite simple. It's an economic system based on business models that replace the end of life concept. And we have to look at all of the business models within the public sector, the private sector, the third sector, and with individuals in the middle looking at how can we transition all of these business models into a circular fashion. And in doing so, what we're able to do is be able to map out any circular initiative and we develop dynamic case studies. And all of these data points that you're seeing here are dynamic data built on a digital infrastructure that allows us to learn from this information. An example here in the Oslo region, uh, food banks, Matsintalen, this is a solution that can be scaled, replicated and networked. It produces not only environmental impact and economic impact, but the social impact through their ecosystem is very important. We identify the scope and the scale, who the stakeholders are that are involved, and what part of the cycle phase is this? Is this consumption and stock? This happens to be waste collection, waste prevention, as well as waste prevention campaigns. They work along with some of the biggest entities within the food sector to collect food that would have gone to be food waste and repurpose it. They connect with an example such as a resource cafe, which is uh, the Norwegian term for a resource cafe. And what this organization does is they actually collect food that would have been food waste through the food banks. What they do is they work as social enterprise, it's a nonprofit organization, and every week they take that food and redistribute it to families that are struggling socioeconomically. And the social impact here is really impressive. Not only are we seeing environmental impact with reduced waste and increased resource utilization, economic impact of reduced spending and reduced economic pressure, 
but the list of social impact includes uh, increased inclusion, increased local resilience, increased quality of life, reduced social pressure. These are the types of impacts that we need to be able to identify and provide data to policymakers to be able to say, this is what we need to support if we're really going to look at a new economy. We also see fantastic examples in the Oslo region with social enterprise, Kompassmat. This is an organization that is a nonprofit organization, social enterprise, who works with some of the biggest industry players who are producing food, finding sources of food waste and identifying new uses for it. This is something that um, is being incorporated into school cafeterias. It can also be a fantastic opportunity for public procurement for events, for example. They are producing solutions that take material waste and are able to be able to take underutilized human resources in society and develop new innovative business models that can really change the game. Another example would be a digital seed library. This is a case study that shows how you can take a digital software that can enable an entire community to have access to grow food. And by using this solution, what they're able to do is actually be able to confirm and, and ensure that people will be able to bring their seeds back. And these are automated reminders with information on how can you actually source the seeds from the food that you've grown. And the long term impact of this from a, a resilience standpoint is that you're developing a seed bank that is very suited for your microclimate. This is something that long term with climate change we're going to need to be able to see and this again can be replicated scaled it can be networked and this is a new solution that can be part of our food drink and agricultural industry. Now, when we are mapping out circular initiatives, there are a multitude of data points that we look at. We look at the scope, the scale, the stakeholders, um, but one of the key pieces of the puzzle that we need to learn from when it comes to data is the societal readiness level. Any circular initiative, no matter what sector you're in, what scope you're looking at, what scale it may be, it needs to be technically feasible, it needs to be economically viable, environmentally sound, but it also has to be socially acceptable. So the societal readiness levels were inspired by some work done out of the Danish Innovation Fund. Societal readiness level of one is the idea stage. You've identified a problem and you have an idea. You work your way up through the ranks by identifying the stakeholders, developing pilot projects, all the way up to level nine, something that is societally integrated. It's a part of our day-to-day -day lives. We don't even think twice about it. It's just something that we do. The data behind all of these solutions, we need to know how can we enable any solution to get from the idea stage to societal integration. And what we're able to do with all of this data that we're gathering on these unique initiatives, we're able to aggregate it into regional showcases, for example. This is an example where you can go in both to the Umeå region on our platform or into the Oslo greater region and be able to identify dynamically what's happening within agriculture, within education, electronics, health and well-being, food and drink, social enterprise, sharing, reuse and repair. These dynamic solutions allow us to identify and enable other people to do more things that are circular. One of the most innovative solutions of what we can do with this data, because we're mapping out the business models themselves, is that any business model that offers business to business or business to government solutions can show up on a map that can support better public and private procurement. One of the, the biggest hurdles, even though we may set up policy that says, OK, circularity needs to be part of our procurement process, we need to be able to enable those individuals doing the procurement to be able to identify local and regional solutions that are circular. How can we do this? We can dynamically develop new tools using data. And at the same time, we can provide information for individuals. How can you find initiatives that are in your local area that will allow you to have a more integrated circular lifestyle? Dynamic data. Not only can we produce dynamic case studies, as well as regional showcases, we're able to develop new tools that will allow us to find the initiatives that we're looking for.
An example is through the life cycle phase. If you're looking for inspiration to be able to say, what can we do in our region to work either within materials, design, uh, consumption, production, stock, waste, we can break all of that down. We also have the data points that can identify urban, area urban and rural solutions because anyone who's worked in a city knows that you cannot obviously just replicate a rural solution into an urban area or vice versa. How can we develop new solutions to identify these case studies? And so the multitude of data points that we gather, one of the most important ones that we do was identify the barriers and the enablers. We do this by identifying regulatory, market, societal, cultural and technological barriers and enablers and in doing so, we're able to look at how can we connect all of the stakeholders for increased visibility and new market opportunities that support social, economic, and environmental impact. And so circular regions, what we are doing is developing the digital infrastructure that will empower networks of communities with a shared intelligence. Right now, everyone is developing uh, websites, reports, case studies, and none of this information is dynamic. It is, um, it's not data that we can learn from or connect. So we're developing new standards and protocols so that every city, project, cluster, hotspot, hub, network, or region can use these same standards and a digital infrastructure to empower their communities. By first mapping out the circular initiatives, and then integrating the pilots from a nonprofit perspective to support all of those businesses to thrive. We've recently released the Cities and Regions program, which has been built off of our work in Umeå and Oslo. And if anyone is interested in learning more about how they can connect their uh, city to what we're doing to be able to learn uh, within this growing learning network that we're developing, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact me here at Cynthia at circularregions.org. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you very much to Cynthia Reynolds for this uh, insightful presentation featuring regional perspectives and learnings from mapping and bridging top down and bottom up initiatives, also leveraging dynamic data and scaling successful business models. To continue this conversation and build on some of the prompts shared by previous panelists, I'm happy to give the word to Cheryl McCulloch now core member of the Circular Glasgow team. Cheryl has a passion for working with businesses to support their growth and development through the adoption of circular principles. Cheryl takes an innovative approach to raise awareness, connect SMEs and identify potential opportunities while supporting the city's ambitions to be a leading circular city. Welcome. Thank you and good morning. It's, it's lovely to be here with you all. Um, I'll just share my screen, so just bear with me. Can everyone see that? Excellent. I'm going to work on that assumption. Um, so that's great. So um, hi, everyone. So as Simona said, I'm Cheryl McCulloch and I'm the Senior Project Manager working for the Circular Glasgow Initiative at Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. And I'm delighted to be here um, sharing some of Glasgow's story. Um, so just a bit of background in terms of what's been happening in Glasgow. Um, Glasgow's very much um, from the outset taken a bit of a business-led approach to the circular economy in particular. And we very much have a vision to position Glasgow to become a leading circular city. Um, so Glasgow Chamber of Commerce works very closely alongside a lot of our partners, such as, as Glasgow City Council and Zero Waste Scotland, alongside um, V London, and I know that Emma uh, referenced London earlier on today, and Circle Economy. Um, and really, it's been a very much a coalition over the last few years, um, really to, to help drive the circular economy ambition forward in the city, um, initially taking it from a bit of a, a business-led ground-up approach. One of the first things that we did a few years back was um, commission Circle Economy to, to carry out a scan of Glasgow um, to really identify um, where the opportunities and, and how you can make Glasgow a, a circular city. Um, and actually the, the first sector that really came up as a, an industry to, to tackle was indeed food and drink, which is fantastic for us because it really, you know, 
one of the great things about food and drink, apart from anything else, is everyone eats and everyone drinks. So it's very easy to communicate and try to get business to understand some of the challenges around the circular economy, but actually some of the real opportunities for them. Um, our work's very much grown since then. So food and drink continues to be very much a focus for, for Circular Glasgow and, and team. And um, these are just some stats around some of the work that we've been involved in and, and some of the kind of the storytelling opportunities that, that's came about as a result of that. But really bring it back to food and drink, um, and that's very much what the focus of today is all about. Um, one of our first big successes in terms of being able to really communicate that circular economy message was um, a collaboration between a local bakery and a brewery. That was able, you know, the, the, the bakery was able to um, provide unsold um, morning rolls, which is a type of, of bread and that's um, very popular in Scotland. Um, and that was then used to produce beer. Um, so it was a very easy, simple collaboration where we could say very much like the toast ale example, one morning roll um, is equivalent to, to one can of beer. Um, so a really nice story, but something that we could very much hinge the fact of what where the real benefits for circular economy are. Um, whether it's the business benefits um, and also environmental benefits. That was one of the first real things that we could actually take out to the Glasgow market and get them to start thinking about the circular economy as a real as a really important concept and an opportunity. I also just wanted to, to focus on some of the business activity that's happening in Glasgow and um, just some of the different examples here. So if I, one of the ones I wanted to pull out was um, Quantec which is a local company who are using um, fish shells um, as a replacement for plastic and sustainable packaging. So a really nice innovative example. We have um, <clears throat> Deer Green Coffee, a local coffee roasters. And then um, what they've done is um, looked very much in incorporating sustainability throughout their business, but also developed um, one of the first um, coffee cup free or single use coffee cup free um, festivals. Uh, they do a coffee festival annually in Glasgow and cut out all single use plastic. And over the two days, they saved over 18,000 coffee cups, which is a very, you know, it's a small part, but, you know, gives a, a fantastic story in, in the overall ambition. Um, Revive Eco are also doing some fantastic work. Um, they are very much taking, actually, coffee grounds, um, I know that this might be a bit of a theme across today, um, but they're taking um, coffee grounds and using that to create biofuels and oils as a, a replacement for palm oils. And finally, um, from, a, from a business perspective, um, there's a, a movement across the Experience Glasgow, which is a, a regional food group, and um, there'll be very much a campaign that we're involved in supporting, which is called Place Up to Glasgow, but very much taking that message out to the business community and the public around um, zero waste principles. So there's a real movement across the Glasgow business community to adopt circularity um, at the core of what we're doing. But we're also now starting to see that very much from, from a policy perspective as well. Um, as I said earlier on, we work very closely with um, Glasgow City Council. And um, in fact, Andrew as well referenced that. Um, but the City Council last year published a, a circular economy route map for Glasgow. Um, and within that food and drink and the food sectors as a key sector within that, that we really want to see circularity at a policy level very much embedded. Um, the city of Glasgow have a, a number of targets um, that are they're moving towards from, a, from a, uh, the point of view of being carbon neutral by 2030, um, but also through the Scottish government targets by um, reducing food um, waste by 25% or by 33% by 2025 and by 50% by 2030. So there's a number of real drivers for Glasgow to be very much embedding this within the policy, policy landscape. Um, and really underpinning all of that is a, a recently published report, um, which is a very collaborative um, partnership across the city, but it's the Glasgow City Food Plan. And that's looked at a number of different aspects and threads to, to the food landscape in Glasgow. So think, looking at aspects of procurement, looking at business, looking at food poverty, but also looking at the environment and community food. 
And that was really very much looking at bringing the public sector, the private sector, as well as the community together to really make this a, a food plan that's, that's, you know, benefiting all. Um, you know, we know that in Glasgow, um, food and drink um, contributes around 330 million um, to the economy, and about 8% of jobs are within the food and drink sector. But we also know that, you know, we're an island, so a lot of our food is imported. So how can we make our local food systems more, um, I suppose, more sustainable and more prominent and actually really help support the development of that? Um, these are just some of the stats that came out from that um, in support of the, the Glasgow Food Policy Partnership and just some of the statistics um, sitting behind that. But very much for the city of Glasgow, what we're looking to try and do is actually through this, the food plan is embed sort of added within that as well. And we've very much been acting within that. We work with the, the, the team from the food plan and from the city council and um, to try and help work with particularly the business community also much more widely around how we can really help grow some of those business-led things that I spoke about earlier, but how we can grow that across the city and encourage some of the, the local food production to be increased and also make um, the community um, much more um, involved as well. We have um, zero waste shops um, and stores um, in the city, but we also see much more in the way of food pantries and we're developing um, um, propositions around that as well. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an, an insight into um, Glasgow. Uh, more than happy to take any questions at the end, but just wanted to give you a bit of a top line in terms of the city's approach. Um, as I say, it's been it's an absolute pleasure to be working in this. Um, we do work very collaboratively and um, it's, it's fantastic to see that food is becoming much more um, part of the conversation. So I'll hand back to you, um, Simona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, you brought us on the ground with this very important insight of how a big city like Glasgow might implement circular solutions in order to increase the sustainability of its food systems. And I think it was very important to focus on the, the link between urban food policies like the Glasgow uh, Food City Plan and uh, circular solutions. So that, that was very important. Uh, now we move to the to the next contribution. We move to to Milan. I'm very glad about this because it's my city. Uh, with Elisa Porreca, who is project officer for the Milan municipality uh, of the H2020 project Food Trades uh, within the framework of the Milan Food Policy, and she will share with us the important activities of this initiative, uh, which gathers together several EU cities. Uh, in the development and implementation of urban food policies aiming at increasing the sustainability of food systems based on circularity. So please, uh, Elisa, thank you for being here. Thank you, Giacomo, and uh, hello, everybody. And really, I'm, it's fantastic to be connected today and to uh, present you uh, the Food Trace project. I will now share my screen. Give me a minute. I hope you are seeing it. Yes. Yes, perfectly. Great. Uh, so today I will talk to you about the uh, Food Trace project, which is a research project by, uh, funded by the European Commission under the framework of uh, uh, Horizon 2020. And the project is uh, led by the city of Milan, as Giacomo already uh, said very well. Uh, the city of Milan uh, is leading a partnership of 19 partners across Europe, and uh, uh, we have uh, research partners, foundations, private sector, and 11 European cities. They are medium and large cities all across Europe, and you can see them in, uh, in our map here. Uh, it is very important to, to remind you uh, that uh, Food Trace uh, um, is working on the, on the policy making on uh, this uh, development of food policies in which, of course, uh, uh, circular economy uh, is uh, one of the main uh, framework of reference. And it's, of course, uh, uh, our tool to guarantee that uh, the food policies of uh, European cities are um, future, future proof, of course. Um, what we uh, will develop uh, in our 11 cities are 11 living labs based on the multi-actor approach. 
And the, the main aim of these um, living labs uh, is to develop 11 pilot actions, testing solutions in our cities, as well uh, as in Milan. And also uh, through the course of the four years of the project, also to develop 11 uh, food policies. Uh, our cities are at very different stages of uh, developing integrated strategies on their food systems. Uh, but of course, uh, this is the main challenge. So to see and test how we can develop the next generation of food policies in Europe, uh, starting from different fields and testing different solutions and see and actually assess how they can impact uh, our food systems and if they can make, make them uh, more sustainable, more resilient, more equitable and really capable to involve all the actors uh, of the cities and of the urban, uh, urban environments. For this reason, the Living Labs will involve the civil society organizations, the private sector, and of course, the Food Trace Consortium will provide uh, a very strong scientific support to the development of these Living Labs first and then of the, um, of the pilot solutions. Uh, one very interesting issue for us uh, is to really prove uh, and advocate uh, on the idea that cities are ready and uh, are the main actors uh, in the debate on how to uh, develop a sustainable food system, uh, because cities are not only capable of uh, um, gathering all the key actors in the, in the local context, but also to assess the impact and to make it uh, very impartial and to give and to discuss this kind of uh, numbers and this kind of uh, data with the key stakeholders that can help the, also the economic sustainability of these actions. I think uh, that it's really interesting, the contribution uh, that was made before about uh, the digital infrastructures that is needed to uh, provide this kind of data and make them very accessible. And on the issue of uh, knowledge exchange and data availability, uh, the first batch of work that Foodtrace is uh, developing in the first year is a very huge mapping activity that was made possible by one uh, very big effort that was made by the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Uh, which is a global commitment of mayors that was launched in 2015 by the city of Milan. And that since 2016 launched uh, a tool to gather the knowledge on the most innovative food policies and food actions developed worldwide. Of course, uh, our project uh, being funded by the European Commission's, uh, Commission will uh, focus on the experiences coming from Europe but really uh, this tool that was launched uh, and uh, which is called the Milan Pact Awards was a powerful tool to uh, gather knowledge. And of course they were uh, awards. So cities were motivated to participate and they presented uh, all their top innovative actions on food systems. And to, to this date, we have more than 200 good practices on how cities uh, implemented uh, their ideas to make the, to transform really their food systems. And this was at the base of the, this uh, analysis uh, um, made by the uh, research partners of food trails and the results are coming very soon. And uh, it's really uh, important to us to um, present this kind of uh, analysis to all the partners, European partners, but also international uh, actors that are interested in understanding more of how cities can uh, really impact uh, their food systems. And this will be made also by uh, implementing the local uh, pilot actions. The pilot actions will work uh, in several fields of action and the full 2030 framework will be kept as the main framework. So with the four priorities that are nutrition, climate, uh, circularity, of course, and the innovation meant as uh, also 
empowerment of communities. And this really uh, gave us uh, um, a light with which we could uh, look at how we influence uh, uh, key infrastructures in cities, like for example, school canteens, uh, the wholesale markets, uh, uh, ports, uh, fishing ports uh, in, uh, in seaside cities, and um, peri-urban areas for uh, peri-urban uh, agriculture to connect uh, all these infrastructures and to connect uh, all the um, impact that they generate on the local food system. Of course, uh, this, uh, as, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, is key to understand how cities are impacting on their uh, local food system and to be able to see over the years of the project how um, this impact has uh, better uh, the the local context and how it has impacted really on the life of citizens and even of uh, organizations that are dealing with these kind of uh, projects and initiatives. This would be, uh, it's an ambitious goal, of course, but we want to really work with the uh, stakeholders at European level that are managing uh, impact investing and understand how we can um, reorient the budgets that uh, can, be, can be saved from improving our food systems to subsidize this kind of innovative actions. This is our um, goal also to, to attract investments for cities that are ready to uh, implement this kind of innovation. And I try to be brief and if you have any question, I've, I'm available. And thank you again for having me. Thank you very much to Elisa Porreca. Definitely Milan is considered one of the pioneers when it comes to urban food transformation. Also thanks to its Milan Urban Food Policy Pact that as we have seen in a few years has been able to attract over 200 cities worldwide. So it's been really interesting to discover more details about the food trails project. And we can say that living labs are an excellent example of co-creation and open innovation for a circular economy, as they manage to bring together a diversity of stakeholders and encourage experimentation following the much needed systemic approach we mentioned several times during our talk today. We have one more speaker in this session, um, in this section. Uh, I welcome now Einar Klepe Holte. Einar is the founder and CEO of Natural State, managing partner of Nordic Circular Hotspot, co founder of Circularities, and a market economist and sustainability strategist by profession. He is currently leading the Nordic Market Transition Program. As you will hear from his presentation, it's all about value chains for Einar, as he had his formative years as a market economist working with the global food value system of specialty coffee, where digital transparency and direct trade approach disrupted the whole industry in recent years. Please, Einar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Simona. Very nice to be here. Very nice to um, be given the opportunity to uh, give some insight in what we work with. I'm going to be um, sharing screen and hope that will work well. So, do you see this? <clears throat> Is that okay? Yes. Very good. Um, so, thank you again uh, to everyone of you guys uh, inviting us to come here and speak a little bit about uh, where we come from. Uh, it was an extremely interesting topic for me. Uh, the role of cities to boost circularity of food systems as I work with cities and I come from the city's perspective into circular economy. Uh, so I'll take you through that journey very, very quickly. <clears throat> and I came to city development and city working with urban economics and uh, economics of cities through coffee, as you very nicely explained. Uh, it's uh, where I started working with, uh, with the coffee bars and uh, the coffee value chain on the street level of cities before the, the last 10 years have been a city strategist. Uh, and the last five years I've been working as a, under, trying to understand the economics of the city. And I've seen the importance of circular economy in this and also the importance of 
sustainable food systems. So this is a very, very interesting topic and I'm very glad you're putting it on the agenda. So this is me and some of uh, the city scopes that we're working with. It's um, really about content development that we've been working with, uh, with city development, anything from city labs, um, city center strategies, uh, futuring scenarios for cities, um, pretty much uh, in Norway, uh, mostly, but also some in Japan and Tokyo, where I have several companies. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my core. And I this is an excerpt from a presentation I had last week in LA, digitally, for the Specialty Coffee Association, where you connect the new natural and sustainable state of the city and the new natural and sustainable state of coffee. Because for me, it started with coffee and the cityscape, where we worked with exactly, as you said, direct trade, uh, and transition of uh, value chain structures and digital transparency in the coffee value chain. So in 2001 to 2011, I worked with coffee full-time, both internationally on farm, working with the whole coffee chain back to the co coffee bars of Oslo, uh, but also developing these meeting spaces and the important part of the city life. Uh, also having one of my brands, uh, Fuglin, that I took over and I still own uh, has been a key essential in development of direct trade, uh, transparency trade, and understanding the city dynamics, the cityscape and the city economics, uh, bringing uh, resources into that dense transactional system that the city actually is economically. So without <clears throat> too much, too long a story, uh, we formulated a new concept of Fuglin in 2008, 2009, where we combined the day life of a coffee bar and a coffee and retail shop uh, with the nighttime activization and the local food system cocktail bar. Ecologi ecological food became a fashion in 2008 and we made an ecological co coffee bar. We did harvesting local produce in drinks and you made kind of this new Nordic cocktail, cocktail wave. In addition, we had, Fugland was an old place. It was from 1963, it was beautiful, original. Everything was taken care of. And we started working with finding vintage furniture of high value, you know, historical vintage pieces. And we started working with selling these in the coffee shop. And that was Fuglin. So there I started working with circular economy in the space of a coffee bar uh, uh, with transparency trade. And we started telling the stories of these furniture uh, and kind of really understanding the long-term perspectives of, of quality. Um, and specialty coffee is also can be called quality coffee as quality in itself is an understanding of uh, sustainability, for instance. But it really is about the cityscape, the city dynamics and the city people, the city functions and the city forms, kind of utilizing the resources that comes in through the food systems. And it's about the people. And it's about the people in both ends, always. So this is a, one of the longest coffee chain, no value chains of food in the world. It's the coffee food value chain. And I've been working, as I said, in this for, for, for 20 years now, understanding the natural impact in both local communities. It's local society to local society. And that is the chain structure. And it can be explained in pictures and it can be explained in flavors, but it normally is explained in economic measures, right? So this is a classical economical explanation of what you just saw. It is the different income streams and cost streams and revenue streams of a business working in the cityscape with the plural of income streams because it has so many offers. And this is the value chain. So when you work uh, going from an economic perspective to a value chain perspective, we look at where is the impact structures, local community to local community. So this is an impact um, analysis of the value system of coffee, where we look at the human factor on the top, the local society and the local knowledge, uh, employment, all the effects of that. And we look at the natural effect at the bottom. And the market and the value chain in the market is just a system that transfers value, right? And it happens to be linked. Now, this looks very linear, doesn't it? It looks like uh, you're picking up the coffee somewhere and then you bring it into the city and you consume it. Um, but food systems are linear because you consume the food. There is waste streams, there is natural resources, there's all of these elements, but it's really about making this transparent, working as direct as you can, open and with a solidaric value chain because food needs processing, food needs to be picked, needs quality orientation. So if you disrupt the value chain of uh, with transparency and you find all value creating elements in the value chain, you, you can say that they will be able to take out income because they create value. So this is a very interesting way of understanding food system approach uh, with structures. And when you apply bioeconomy, carbon economy, sharing economy, circular economy, 
or local economy or direct trade digital economies to these factors, you start analyzing other factors. So when we did this analysis of the coffee chain, we found several circular potentials. For instance, of course, the coffee gravel that uh, comes out in the end, you can use that, that for food, uh, for, for soil improvement. Uh, you can use it for making new materials. Uh, you, of course, there's a massive amount of nutrition in this food system. You bring nutrition from equator to the city. And if you waste that, that's a shame. It's like the salmon going up the rivers of Alaska. You, they bring nutrition from the ocean. And this way you should look at food systems and always trying to bring back to to nature so it's not it's kind of really understanding the natural resource system and this is kind of where we grew up and this is also where the cityscape came from so connecting all the value chains in a city you really understand the dynamics and the potential of the urban economics with circular economy so this is where i work and this is what we work with so we work with the value chains the market as a structure of value chain a market sphere where you also have impact chains into society nature and human and it's really about circular economies about natural resources in connectivity with the human value sphere uh, through the market and system, uh, society system. So it's about nature, humans, society in one integrated dynamic structure. This is where we work. And this is very interesting because working 10 years in Japan, you understand the effect that the Japanese market culture is deeply rooted in nature as the Nordic is deeply rooted in society. And you understand these value principles different. So to bring that into the context, this is how we work, taking this understanding of natural resource into the societal and market system created by humans, right? And in connecting. And this is where we define the core value spheres of the market. And this is how we work with the new economic languages. For instance, last week, Nature Positive was presented by World Economic Forum as the new climate neutral. And this nature positive is extremely, extremely important because there is no food that is not, not naturally grown. It is always a part of our system. And it is quite logical because we as humans are natural beings and we are deeply connected to nature. And that is where I see the potential of circular economy as well as one of the best economic explanations on resource management of natural resource for humans in the structure and especially in the dynamic and dense market spheres of the cities where you need to really understand and maximize these profits. So the drivers of the market and society is what we work with. And we work with awareness of sustainability and circularity is key for sustainability. And we work with different approaches like the Nordic approach, uh, the nature approach, there's all kinds of understandings. And this is where we, because what we're working with, we work with value dynamics, we're economists, we work with the market dynamics and with food, it's about the local global and it's the urban rural and it's the human nature dynamic that is really, really, really important to understand. So this is just bringing us all over to the sustainability economies for sustainable development. And this is where I discover circular economy. Because when you work with holistic city development, you have to understand all of these in connectivity. It's a bit like the hive economy that was presented by Keith Robert, Donut Economies, Harvard Economics and Rethink Economics in 2019. It really shows the complexity, but it's really about understanding which economic principle you should apply to which value chain. And that is where we're working with now. And now we're saying that we should really orient towards circular value chains and principles for sustainable value development. And of course, bioeconomic, sharing economy, eco-economy and local economy after the COVID. It's really interesting to look at this and look at these perspectives. Because if you find the values and explanations, you can then formulate the new economies. And you can find the new values that you can count, right? So within societal sphere, it's about innovation, collaboration, and learning. This is very important for a city. And for a natural perspective, we always have been relating to the circular and the longevity of natural resources in the city. And it's the contextual value of the city. And of course, it's the environmental impact of the cityscape. This is a methodology for city development. And a city is nothing without its humans. You have to understand that it's the city life that gives the city, its identity, its feeling, how you, how you feel about it. And that's why the identity value and the emotional value of these structures are so important. And that is what we work with. So when you look at this and we start working with circular economy as a principles towards holistic city development and identity of city development, we started finding a lot of interesting factors. So we could make completely new structures with the sustainable economy approach or circular economy approach, for instance, with reuse of vacant shopping malls. We started re 
structuring and reprogramming them with market mechanisms that really nurture and take care of the circular principles in any value chain. We start reusing buildings. That's also circular economy. So you really can apply anything. You can re reuse uh, square meters. You can share area. You see it and look at that as a resource. And you start applying market functions in the cities that actually give these offers and start relating to these new businesses. So this is an example from Hamar, and this is an example from Trondheim, where it was two vacant areas in the deep city core that could be reactivated by businesses on circular and sustainable principles. So this is where I also start working very closely with Catherine Bart, uh, my colleague here in Natural State, which she runs Circularities, and she invited me in to the Nordic Circular Hotspot. So can we apply this contextual economic model also to a region of the Nordic Circular Nor Nordics? And this has been what we've been working intensely with the last year. Can we apply this deep understanding of value chain oriented market structuring and function it and make awareness? And this is an excerpt from the Nordic Circular Summit that we had last year. And as, as you see on the right side, we had city life, circular city life, and we had food systems. So to really start connecting these two is extremely important. And with what we're building now, we're building this hotspot. It consists of the partnerships, we are all partners and we have the digital circle arena where you have all stakeholders, the partners who work for the stakeholders. And then of course we have the summit where we create awareness in the Nordic market. So all of you are of course, welcome to, to go and have a look at that. And, but what we're actually working on in the partnership is to understand the dynamics of a contextual market. This is placemaking, place economy or city urban economic approach where you take the horizontals and the verticals of the market and you apply place, the context. And this is very interesting when you start looking at how you can formulate circular structures in the market itself. So we look at the um, vertical factors of the market, that is the value chains, and they go towards market segments and us people as receivers. And it's always about bringing natural resource to the humans in the market, through the market and systemic systems. And then of course you have the horizontal factors, they are the enablers of the value chain. That's innovation, finance, banking, accounting, auditing, that's those factors. So we have the verticals and the horizontals of the market described. And you see food and beverage on the, is on the top of the natural resource market segment structure. That is the most important value chain to work with because we are also dependent on it. And, and, and then of course you have the context, which we're talking about the here, the European context, the Nordic context, the national, local, global context. That is the regulatory structures. For instance, when we were working with a coffee chain, we found that we, we couldn't apply uh, coffee uh, waste on the, on, to the farms because of food safe security. It was an obstacle in the law. law. We couldn't do it. It was a regulatory uh, process. So you really need to understand that there's three factors. And it's of course place, it's natural resource, which is also extremely important with a food system because you have to have natural resource systems. So this is where we are kind of working in this structure and we're formulating now new collaborative structures within the value chains of the Nordics. And that is how we work. Back to the value chain. This is how you need to understand it in connectivity. And this is what it can mean for a city. This is a cityscape in Oslo where food and beverage is the core essence. We said we need more food production in the city. So we built the whole neighborhood uh, baseline with vacant car industry on food production orientation. You can just bring in the value chain. If you have a transparent value chain, you see which value producing link you can put in, refit into the city. You can shorten the value chain, you can make local production, you can create workspaces working with the food system structure. And this is exploding in Norway now, how you, we want to really have the shortest possible connectivity with local food production, give accessibility market position in the cities to the local producers. So you start making local food structures, less tr uh, transporting, less uh, climate effect, more uh, identity because you have the local food re-emerging and you don't waste food in the supermarkets, which is the most, is, is the functions that waste most food because they throw it when you can't have it. If you buy it directly and you buy it yourself, you maintain your food. So you cut out the links. And of course you have these factors that is now evolving in Oslo. You have rest, which is a super fine dine restaurant only with leftover food. You have companies working with the, the diversity of mm -hmm. materials and structures that can be going in there. And you have, of course, uh, wasted apples and too good to go. All of these structures are now happening. And it's about the principles of retrade or re-commerce where sustainability and circular economy is the main principles. 
and it's transparency and solidarity in the value chains, which is the kind of secondary most important principle. Local activization, identity, and then of course, social and work employment structures. This Sorry, Einar. Thank we, you. <laughs> we are going very late. We, we have to respect a little bit this, the schedule. Thank you very much, Thank Einar. you very much. Thank <laughs> Sorry you, for Einar. That. No, but uh, I'm, so, this is the last so, slide. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Excellent to learn more about your professional journey and have this economics perspective. Also, dive deeper into the value chain of coffee, given its relevance as one of the most consumed products in the world. So thanks again to all the speakers involved in our Cities Case Studies section. We are sure that all the best practices you shared can be extremely valuable for other cities on their way towards a circular food transition for policymakers, businesses, and citizens. And now I am very happy to give the word to Alessio Dantino, CEO and founder of Forward Fooding, who will moderate the next section of our today's EU circular talk, which will be a panel discussion titled Innovation in Urban Food Transformation. On to you, Alessio. Thank you very much, Simona, and uh, I'm super glad to be here as well uh, to moderate this uh, uh, duo interview with uh, David and Christopher. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, jump straight into that. Uh, as you know, the, way, the, the, the issue of food waste is a big one to tackle, uh, and here, uh, we basically are going to be featuring in the next interview uh, two companies that are tackling uh, this issue. Uh, I would call them startups, but again, uh, it's difficult to define you know, what a startup these days is. <laughs> but first, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to basically get them both on the screen if uh, you guys allow me to, uh, to do so. And while I do that, I would start maybe with David, uh, David Cash from Wasteless. Um, if you can uh, tell us a bit more about uh, your company, uh, who, for everyone who doesn't know what you guys do, and tell us a bit about the story behind this creation. Thanks, Alessio. Uh, great to see you again. Um, we, we've been in a couple of panels uh, together. So what Wasteless does is very simple. We help retailers become a lot more profitable. And we do that by helping them sell food that would other, otherwise have gone to waste. Um, we, have a, we are a software company and we have an algorithm enabling them to price products with a shorter shelf life uh, to make it attractive for you as a customer to buy it uh, rather than a product with a longer shelf life. That's, that's how simple it is. And it's really essential because uh, Cheryl um, Color of uh, Glasgow she identified that 30% of uh, carbon emissions in Glasgow are caused by food. And if you know that over one third of food is wasted, 11% of Glasgow's CO2 emissions are from food that is wasted. And we should be preventing that before we become uh, circular and before we, uh, we actually uh, apply all the other methods. So keen to talk to you and uh, let's continue this, uh, this conversation. Thanks, Alessio. Fantastic. Thank you, David. And thanks also for uh, Simone and Paula for <laughs> the technical support here. Christoph, welcome. Uh, Christoph is uh, the Global Public Affairs Manager at Too Good To Go. I don't think the, uh, it needs a lot of uh, introduction, but <laughs> uh, Christoph, if you can tell us a bit more about uh, Too Good To Go for anyone who doesn't know, and uh, um, tell us a bit about the story maybe behind this creation. Yeah, uh, with pleasure. And uh, hi, everyone. Hi, hi, hi Alessio. And uh, thanks for having us here. Um, very excited to share share the story and, and contribute to uh, to this panel and to this event. So um, for those of you that don't know Too Good To Go, Too Good To Go is a social impact company uh, focused on food waste and really, on the one hand, giving people the tools to fight food waste on a day to day basis. And on the other hand, inspiring uh, people on the issue of food waste uh, and, 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 you know, stressing how important the, the reduction of, uh, of food waste is. So um, we have that marketplace on the one hand, a marketplace for surplus food, where we, where we connect consumers to stores that have leftover food to allow people to buy food that otherwise would have gone to waste at the end of the day. So we do that with various types of food businesses, whether they are restaurants, bakeries, supermarkets, directly from manufacturers, etc. Um, that's that's basically our, our the operational part of our business, that marketplace for surplus food. On the other hand, we have 
you know, such a big community that has evolved around to, to go. We have about 40 million users uh, in 15 countries now, and we work with about 100,000 um, food businesses. And having this big community around us, we, we wanted to do more and we've created or we, we're trying to create this, this movement against food waste to really to build and raise that awareness uh, for the issue. So, so briefly on the story, Too Good To Go was founded uh, in Copenhagen uh, five years ago by a, by a group of students who, uh, who went into a, uh, a buffet restaurant and you know, saw the, the, the food that was literally being thrown away in the buffet when, when only half of, of, of a certain dish is, is left. It was just being discarded so that you know, consumer could always be presented with a, with a full dish of every, uh, of every uh, yeah, dish of choice in the buffet restaurant. And so you know, they thought there must be something we can, we, we can and we need to do about this issue. And uh, you know, five years later, this is, this is where we are. We, uh, we're, um, we're raising awareness and, and saving surplus food in, in 15 countries, 14 of them in, in Europe, uh, plus the US. Um, as I said, with about 40 million users and, and, and 100,000 food businesses. And I, I want to tap into that, uh, Christophe. You're not just raising awareness. It's about actionable awareness. And that's really what needs to be done. People are aware, but people need to be incentivized and uh, also uh, uh, seduced to actually take action. And those actions that are at impact, uh, that, make, uh, that, that, that can scale and, and be profitable, are, uh, are, are what we need to repair the food system. I uh, sorry. That's it's great to uh, great to be uh, to be talking to you uh, on this. That's awesome, guys. I mean, uh, we're jumping straight into the awareness uh, uh, conversation, which I guess is crucial and is clearly what drives uh, also change, right? In a way. So, just to articulate a bit more on that, uh, um, when it comes to and, and to get it, bring everyone up to speed also with uh, David Solutions, as uh, you know, Christoph is more. Christoph Solutions too good to go is more consumer facing. So let's get back to you, David. You're tackling basically the issue at the, the sort of purchasing you know, level as you're helping basically retailers to better you know, handle food. But can you please, yeah. can you please specifically um, as to articulate on which part of the food waste issue you know, yeah. you're tackling it's... and what is the impact you actually want to have as a company? Yeah. Cool. So, um, so imagine uh, tonight, uh, uh, Alessio, you're going into your, uh, your favorite uh, Dia store in, uh, in Barcelona. And, uh, you, you know, you've had this, this, uh, this uh, morning, you don't feel like cooking. So you're, uh, you're picking up a ready-made salad. Mm -hmm. And you have the choice between a salad that has a July 4th expiration date and one that has a July 7th expiration date. So most customers, they reach to the back of the shelf and uh, make a mess of the shelf that, uh, that, that the store has been working hard on and, and take the longer dates. And that's because there's no reason for you. Uh, they, they, they both have the same price. Uh, one of them has a higher perceived uh, freshness, but both of them are healthy, both of them are tasty. So what we do is we find the optimal price point to incentivize you, uh, give you this endorphin rush of getting a great deal as well as doing something good for the planet. Now the second, so this is really very customer facing, but what we're trying, what we're trying to achieve and what we were doing in Milan, for example, with a supermarket called Iper, is we are creating, we're inserting data into the food system. And what we're helping them to do is not just perpetuate the problem, not just keep on overdimensioning the production uh, and producing for either diversion or the food bank or too good to go or uh, incineration, but to actually use that data uh, and optimize uh, production, optimize uh, the supply. And this is what, uh, what a, a great Boston consultancy report that I quote from a lot, uh, uh, August 29th, uh, 2019. What it said is food waste is a multi-trillion problem and about, uh, so they say 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollar problem with a 700 billion solution. And a large part of it is in improving uh, supply chain efficiencies in using, in, in datafying foods, understanding where things go wrong and repairing it. Because, and, uh, and then I'm gonna hand over to Christophe and hear his, his views, but um, because 
as long as we are um, just um, um, not solving the problem, but dealing with the problem, we're basically uh, mapping, mapping with the tab running. So th there's a problem, the food system is broken, and we are just, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're map mopping up the water rather than looking where the leaks are. And this is why, is why a collaboration between companies uh, along the chain, all the way from the seat, all the way to, uh, you know, it's my kitchen in the back. There is, I think there is some food in my, in my, in my, uh, uh, in my waste bin. It shouldn't be there. You know, it, uh, I, I should be planning better. I am planning as best as I can, but we need to, we need to collaborate on this. And data and money are the two uh, red threads that are really helping uh, companies as well as consumers along the supply chain, along the demand chain to, uh, uh, to, to start solving this. And we are citizens of cities and cities have a very big role to play in, in repairing the food system. We're mostly consumers and we should be helping suppliers, retailers to, to up their game. It's 2030 is around the corner, guys. It's, uh, I just calculated today, it's about 2000 days away. It's not a lot. So we don't really have a lot of time here, I think. And <laughs> so if, uh, if I understand this correctly, and David, that I know the, the solution really well, but it's to basically level up also the knowledge here so that we can have an insightful conversation. Um, you're basically tackling the issue before it starts, basically before it hands into uh, the consumer hands and then gets turned into waste, you basically try to optimize that. And the sort of ingredients of the recipe here are data and money as you're basically helping the retailers to better manage it. Now over to Christoph, same question. Um, what, what actually part of the, of, or what shade, let's, let's, let's put it that way, of the food waste issue you actually tackle and what is the impact you actually want to generate with Too Good To Go? Yeah, thanks, Alessio. I mean, I think um, it's it's fair to say that we're we're mostly focused on 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 consumers, um, which is which is super important because at the end of the day, uh, about fifty percent of all food waste happens at at consumer level. So you know, we wanna we wanna give those consumers the tools and and you know inspire them to you know um, do something and find a newfound respect for for food and in that way you know achieve. Uh, partly um, uh, a more sustainable food system. So we're mostly focused on consumers, but we also work with other parts of the food chain from, from, from retail to manufacturers, um, from, the, from the marketplace perspective of, of Too Good To Go, it's very simple because we, we link supply with demand, we link consumers with, with, uh, with food businesses. Um, it's fair to say that uh, we, we operate uh, throughout the, 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 the actors in the, in, the, in the food chain. So that's for the app. For the campaigns that we run, for the, the awareness campaigns or the actionable awareness campaign, uh, as, uh, as David says, um, again, um, it's, it's, it's across the, the board. Um, we try to identify problems where, where they are and, 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 and you know, work towards finding a, a solution, uh, a behavioral solution in them. Uh, one of the problems we, we, we had looked at were expiry dates on, on, on products, for example. So uh, specifically the realization that you know, consumers are insufficiently aware of the difference between use by dates and best before dates and the behavior to adopt uh, with, with one or the other. And that uh, best before products are perfectly safe to, to consume after the date expires, um, as long as you, know, you, you, you trust your senses, you look, smell, taste, you, know, you have a, a, a bit of a personal uh, approach to that product and you don't just throw it away when the, when the date hits. So you know, we started this campaign uh, that now operates in about 10 countries in Europe where we work with retailers and food manufacturers to uh, raise awareness for the issue. Um, so what we've done is that we've created a specific label which uh, invites consumers to look, smell, taste uh, best before products and not just throw it away at the date. Um, we've got about 250 brands across Europe that have now committed to change their packaging and include that label on the products, um, which we don't necessarily think should be a, a long-term solution, but we want to create this this you know this stop and pause moment with consumers to really think about what we're what they're doing with their food and with with their products, um, you know hopefully this can be a sort of a, 
a stepping stone towards better and improved and more understandable date labels in the future. Um, some of you know that the, the, the EU is, is, is currently working on legislation to reform date labels on products and make them more understandable uh, so that they lead to less food waste. We hope this campaign can be a stepping stone um, as, as, as we get to, to more improved uh, date labels. But I mean, that's just one of the, of the examples of, of, the, of the campaigns that we run that you know, seek to uh, uh, change behaviors on the consumer end, but also with, with manufacturers who take that commitment with us to actually change their packaging uh, and, and insert that, uh, that, uh, that visual, that, that uh, look, smell, taste, uh, words, pictograms uh, to, to, uh, to get consumer awareness for the, for the issue. That's awesome. And again, the, the word that I keep hearing here is, is awareness, right? So <laughs> I'm going to try to spice up the conversation because, of course, you know, from awareness comes change, as we said. So yeah. I'm going to try to spice up the conversation. I would love to get like a sort of a back to back here from <laughs> Microsoft and David. Um, what else actually can be done to raise awareness? Because I understand that, you know, David did too is uh, you know, getting the retailers to understand that by actually tackling the issue, they can even make, you know, more money through data. Christoph's issue is uh, we need to get more consumers to actually go and ask basically the retailers and all the other, you know, stakeholders in the ecosystem to actually change the way they advertise, sort of, so to speak, best before and best buy, right? As part of the big, the big, a big part of your campaign, I think Haynes said, uh, changing the way you know this information are conveyed to consumers right so what do you guys think it's more like a brainstorming session almost right what do you think can be done beyond what is what are you guys already doing to really kind of almost raise the level of awareness in general you know the consumer side and the customer side even higher than it is right now what do you think it should be done right i think i think i think it's uh emma chow uh, from the Rockefeller, uh, sorry, from uh, the uh, Ellen Carter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she said she had one slide where she said that the food system for every euro we're consuming is causing two euros of problems. Um, so what we, what I think we need to do at uh, on the larger scale is incentivize all the actors in the chain being governments all the way to the consumer and including business and incentivizing them to uh, reduce those two euros, that, that incredible ratio. Uh, carbon tax is definitely one of them because if you're polluting, you should be paying for it because someone is paying for it. And, uh, and, and now there's no incentive uh, to, uh, to really uh, tackle food waste along the chain because it's part of, uh, of business as usual. So incentives are, are really, really key. Um, and I, I, you know, I, already, I already mentioned uh, something that, uh, 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 that is very dear to my heart and it's actually understanding what we're doing and being able to follow what we're doing. For that, we need data. So when Christophe talks about date labeling, um, we, are, we should be leapfrogging, leapfrogging the issue. The issue is not about labeling uh, and keeping the, the, the packaging stupid. It's about making the packaging smart. Mm -hmm. So we should, so the date labels should be uh, smarter. They should include the date in the, in the, either in an RFID, like they're trying to do in Japan, or because that's, it's, probably, uh, it's probably too expensive, to just have um, uh, QR codes instead of EN13. You know, the EN13 is the barcode that you all know. It has 13 little bars. It only identifies the, uh, the little, uh, the little, the, 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 the item doesn't say anything else. We have new standards uh, where, for example, the QR code that uh, are great for traceability. Uh, and then you know what part of the stable the cow came from. So if something goes wrong with a batch of meat, you don't have to throw away all of the meat. You can actually pinpoint the problem. They're doing this in the US. So the FDA is actually mandating uh, uh, this kind of traceability now for, uh, uh, for leafy greens. Uh, the EU should be doing this. But, and I know there's some, uh, some people from the, from the commission on the call. One of the things is in the farm to fork strategy, prevention of food waste should not be the last words of, the, of their document, which it was. 
it should be the first one. Because if we're preventing food waste, we're redesigning the system, and then the entire system, uh, all the blood, sweat, and tears that go into uh, greener protein, into more conscious consumption, into urban farming, they will be they will uh, have a much better ROI. So the prevention of food waste through data, through incentives, through carbon tax, that's really where uh, where we should be heading. Christophe, I would love to uh, to hear your perspective. <laughs> Said it all, David. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the same page, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, you know, I think there's there's different things that that can be done and and or that should be done, and they're they're actually quite different if you if you look at consumers on the one hand, or if you look at you know businesses, manufacturers, producers on on the other hand. Um, I, I we we talked a lot about awareness, and we don't need to talk more about that. Uh, but I do want to stress that you know we know that from a consumer perspective perspective, there is insufficient awareness for the issue of food waste. Um, you know, we know from studies and research that nobody nobody wants to, to waste food. Everybody hates it, uh, yet people do it. Everybody does it. Um, uh, more or less, uh, it depends, but but uh, there is still, still an issue there. And, you know, one of the things we think is needed is, is to make clearer the link between, one, uh, the impact that food waste has uh, on, on, on climate change, um, because that is clearly insufficiently uh, present, um, but also stressing that at the same time, food waste, and that has been shown by, by a project, I don't know if you guys know, it's called Project Drawdown, that reducing food waste is the most impactful, the easiest, and the most actionable, immediately actionable solution to reduce... And the most, profit, and the most profitable. It's the number one solution to, uh, to, reducing, uh, to reducing uh, the climate crisis. So it's a massive problem in the sense that, you know, I mean, we said it before, a third of all food produced uh, is lost or wasted. And at the same time, you know, 800 million um, people globally uh, go, go hungry every day. So this structural... And one, and one, billion, and one billion people uh, are obese and don't have access to good, healthy food, yes. which is, it's all part of the same water bath uh, problem. Yeah, so this you know structural imbalance is what we need to tackle and and and, and the awareness for it. Um, I'm I'm picking up on something that Ander said, uh, Ander from the OECD earlier today, um, specifically in the context also of this this webinar is is the role of cities and you know cities are are where where uh, where food is consumed, uh, but cities are also places where where resources, including food, are wasted. So uh, we need a massive focus on on cities to bring. To bring the issue closer to the people, uh, we need local level uh, action on, on, on tackling food waste. Um, earlier this year, we started a campaign we took to go called Cities Against Food Waste. It started in France. It's going to uh, um, start growing into Germany soon, and we expect it to, to, to grow into other countries afterwards. Um, the principle is very simple. You know, we work on a framework uh, hand in hand with, uh, with, a, with a city. Uh, to get from that city a level of commitment on, on, on food waste reduction, measurable targets that are implementable and, 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 and traceable, and for the city to take concrete action, both on the prevention side, but also uh, on the awareness side of food waste reduction. Um, so, you know, that's something that we're doing to bring the, the issue closer to, uh, to the place where, 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 where food is consumed and wasted, and hopefully to increase that, you know, awareness link between climate change impacts and scalable solution uh, of, you know, behavioral change on, on food waste. I want to, I want to add, if, 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 uh, Alessio, if you allow me, can I add I one really level of... to wrap this up because we're, okay. we're overrunning okay. it, but guys, you did a tremendous job, a terrific job at like actually drilling down the problem and what are actually the actionable solutions that can be implemented beyond what you're already uh, doing. So thanks a lot for sharing this. Thanks a lot for inviting me also to moderate this panel. It's been a pleasure. And I'll give it back to Simona to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Alessio. Yes. Thanks, Alessio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessio, for the entertaining moderation and to our panelists, David and Christophe, for sharing their experience with Wasteless and to Good To Go. Continuing this section, uh, we have Nicolaus Tavos. He is the co-founder and manager of the Cluster of Bioeconomy and Environment of Western Macedonia. Since 2008, he has 
been working as a project manager for different EU programs to several organizations on different projects related to energy, bioeconomy, circular economy, industrial symbiosis, urban and rural development and entrepreneurship. On to you. Thank you, Simon. I will try to be fast because I know that we are running late. So uh, I will skip the first uh, the first slides that uh, uh, see uh, that uh, picture our uh, area, the region of West Macedonia in Greece. Uh, you can find it earlier. I will send it to you. Uh, so just a few uh, words. We're not a typical uh, Greek region. We're a mountainous region, not the typical uh, Greek island region. So uh, we have a good major energy sector, uh, which is declining through due, due to the decommissioning. And as a cluster, we were established in 2014 as a bottom-up approach, and we are trying to develop and common business and energy activities in the fields of bioeconomy and environment. Some of the areas of activity, one of these is the circular economy and bioeconomy in Western Macedonia. More than 40 uh, quintuple helix members and uh, nowadays we have 13 uh, projects. Uh, uh, I will present two of them uh, in, in brief uh, that are dealing with uh, circularity and food systems and uh, in general about the urban bio-waste valorization. It's the Scalibur project and it's the Hook project. So uh, the Scalibur project uh, has two uh, prongs uh, attack to improve bio-waste collection and to create high value products from bio-waste. Uh, it is uh, an Horizon 2020 project uh, uh, and it's about scalable technology for bio-urban waste recovery and it's more that we have 21 partners from eight countries. Uh, the best practice for sorting and pre-treatment will be identified including a monitoring system to detect contaminants developed by IRIS, our partner IRIS, and the bio-waste fraction will be characterized to find the optimal compositions for conversion into high value products. Uh, we have one lighthouse city, the city of Lund, and uh, uh, three follower cities. One of them is uh, Kozani, the capital of Western Macedonia. And we have a big activities regarding the citizen engagement that CSP uh, is uh, performing. So three uh, uh, value chains, the household bio-waste, the urban sewer slats, and the Horeca and retail bio-waste. And the, all the partners will create new business opportunities by demonstrating these three innovative value chains to transform bio waste into high value industrial uh, products. Uh, the impact will be uh, quite significant. The increase of bio waste collects by 15 to 40 percent on pilot cities, extra 22 million tons collected and valorized per year, decrease of greenhouse gas emissions of 20 to 1.79 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. They prove citizen participation, separate collection and acceptance of bio-waste derived products and different other uh, impacts. Uh, a number of assessments will evaluate the impact of the Scalibur project through techno-economic, regulatory, environmental life cycle, safety, sustainability, and social aspects. And uh, Scalibur, together with two other projects, the Value Waste and uh, Waste Up, uh, was uh, created a new proposal, a new project uh, that is HOOP, um, so, uh, who proposal, who proposal uh, has uh, some current challenges? The European throw away 2,100 uh, kilos of bio waste per year. 75% of bio waste is landfill or incinerated. Landfill bio waste causes emission and pollution, and one, one, 143 million annual costs associated with the bio waste in EU. So, what is the vision? the urban uh, circular bioeconomy. The EU bioeconomy strategy sees cities become major circular bioeconomy hubs where bio waste is a feedstock for safe and sustainable bio-based products. But up to now, very few cities and regions have developed circular bio-based economy strategies or projects for the production of innovative bio-based products. So this is the HOOP solution. The HOOP project supports eight lighthouse cities and regions in developing large-scale urban circular bioeconomy initiatives as well as unlocking significant investments in eight territories who will foster replication across Europe. Uh, the partners, you can see them here. Um, so eight lighthouse cities and region uh, will have a 50, will uh, investigate 50 bioprocesses and through a project development assistance uh, uh, scheme uh, and stakeholder engagement mobilization, we will have also a replication ability strategy 
and networking of cities and region in other areas. Uh, these are the eight loud house cities and regions. Uh, the region of West Macedonia is considered one of them, one of those. And the Hoop project uh, will provide, as I already told you, the project development assistance to these eight lighthouse cities and regions, providing them with the technical, economic, financial, and legal expertise needed to develop concrete investments to valorize the organic fraction of municipal solid waste, but also the urban wastewater sludge, with the aim to obtaining safe and sustainable bio-based products. Hoop offers a portfolio of, the, of 10 pro processes of valorize uh, OFMSW and five processes to valorize uh, urban wastewater sludge. And these processes build on the results of the Horizon 2020 projects of Scalibur, Value Waste and Waste, uh, waste Up. Um, in order to ensure that the needs and interests of all actors are taken into account, local stakeholder boards steer and monitor all engaged activities in the Hoop Lighthouse cities and region. In the eight bio waste clubs, the participants develop and implement shared visions on their circular cities and region. Ownership of the project activities is those given to the local and regional actors, and it will be in their hands to co-create circular solutions and, and to establish new forms of collaboration and, and uh, exchange. Uh, the Hoop network of cities and regions will facilitate exchange and knowledge and mutual learning among cities and regions willing to recover valuable resources from urban bio waste and wastewater. So please visit our uh, network on page for more information and to register your city and region and exchange good uh, practices. Uh, the expected impact is to deliver sustainable circular bio-based economy, economic investor, investments, the creation of a European network of cities and region, to contribute to increased recycling of urban bio-waste and wastewater, to contribute to the creation of green jobs in local economies, and raise awareness about the potential and benefits of urban bioeconomy among EU citizens and the media. So uh, try to be quick. I'm at your availability for further questions if this is possible. Uh, Simone, thank you. Thank you so, so much also for your flexibility and for the precious insights that you have uh, shared with us that will be very valuable for all our audience, I'm sure. We are now heading towards the end of our EU circular talk. So I am pleased to invite Karen Fabri and Chiara Nobili for the closing remarks. Starting with Karen, uh, Karen is the deputy head of the unit Bioeconomy and Food Systems at the European Commission. She has been developing the Food 2030 initiative to structure, connect and scale up European research and innovation for sustainable food systems transformation by addressing key priorities, including circular and resource efficient food systems. She will provide us with an overview of the EU perspectives on the subject, such as the policies needed to support this transition. Welcome, Karen, on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. And thank you for inviting me and to provide some concluding remarks and a future outlook. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that I was very impressed by, by many of the showcases here uh, this morning and, and startups. It just shows just how much exciting work is, is happening all over Europe. Um, this is a particularly pivotal year uh, because of the first ever UN Food Systems Summit, which is really gonna set the ambition for the years to come um, to transform food systems. And we're, we're very deeply engaged in this and welcome you all to, to take part, to, to be part of that change. A few words now on, on the policy framing. So we know that reducing environmental and climate footprints uh, of food systems is very much at the heart, of course, of the UN Food Systems Summit, of our European Green Deal, uh, circular economy, farm to fork strategy, and bioeconomy strategies. So uh, there's, there's many, let's say, policy framings out there now that, that are, are really gonna be helping in setting the direction. With respect to the farm to fork strategy, it really provides a multi objective vision for sustainable, healthy and inclusive food systems. It's really a strategic approach that is meant to deliver on multiple targets and 27 actions, uh, including, for instance, a new legislative framework for sustainable food systems that is expected in 2023. It will also look at um, the revision of existing legislation. Um, it is setting out a new EU code of conduct for responsible business and marketing. 
It's uh, looking into mandatory front of pack nutrition labeling and sustainable food labeling and uh, an EU level food waste reduction targets. And within the, the farm to fork strategy, the role of cities is, is, is acknowledged and, and we know it needs to be supported. We also have the, um, the EU's uh, bioeconomy strategy, which calls for circularity to address climate change and environmental sustainability. And it too sets out an ambition that cities and urban areas should become major circular bioeconomy hubs. Now, what is the role of RNI policy? Because that's what I represent. Uh, what is the role of RNI policy to, to help this transformation, transformation. And we know that one way of supporting and accelerating the transition that is needed to happen in food systems is by making use of EU financial instruments um, and leveraging of needed investments. And in our case, it's making use of Horizon 2020, which finished now, um, and Horizon Europe, the new framework for program for research and innovation, which began this year in 2021 and will continue on to 2027 with a quite significant uh, multi-billion uh, budget, uh, Euro budget. So RNI will be a key enabler of the transition and our Food 2030 Research and Innovation Policy Framework for Food System Transition provides that strategic orientation that we are deploying through Horizon Europe. But before I go into what lies ahead, let me just mention very quickly the outcome of our Horizon 2020 Green Deal call in which we built up a farm to fork topic, which uh, brought in over 250 proposals which was a huge amount actually, it was, it was the area that brought in that uh, to which the most proposals were submitted, which just shows the potential and interest out there. And seven of these proposals are going to be, are expected to be fund, funded. And under that topic alone, which, um, which had a budget earmarked of 74 million uh, euros, we, we expect to launch demonstrators relevant to climate neutral farms, climate neutral food businesses, uh, pesticide reduction, anti, redu reducing the use of antimicrobials, reducing food losses and waste, and um, uh, demonstrators also supporting sustainable healthy diets. So very interesting things will be coming out of, out of, that, of that call. Now, just quickly looking towards the future at some examples of where Horizon Europe um, can help and, and where it's putting in place actions um, that can support food system transformation, in particular under its cluster six entitled food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment. So uh, we just launched our first calls for proposals here, covering a wide range of topics to further develop the knowledge base, networks, and innovative solutions, uh, many of which are calling for multi-actor, inter and transdisciplinary approaches to meet our sustainable food systems, circular economy and bioeconomy and overall green deal objectives. And we really need to ensure that all regions and cities both engage in this and benefit from this. So here are a few topics that may be of interest and where we strongly encourage interested parties that are active in building circular food systems to submit proposals. And the first one of these really is relevant to our Food 2030 policy framing. So in 2016, we created this concept of Food 2030 to help fix the highly sectoral and fragmented approach to RNI and, and policy also uh, that was prevailing at all scales from local to global. Uh, we collected the evidence, we mobilized a wide diversity of actors, we engaged very deeply with member states also to align our thinking and raise the ambition to rethink how and with whom and on what we should actually work. So in October of last year, we published our report outlining the 10 Food 2030 Pathways for Action as leverage points where research and innovation can really deliver what we call co-benefits, co-benefits to climate, to circularity, to health and communities. And at the heart of all this is really the need to design research and innovation upstream so that it's impact driven, it's systemic, it's multi-actor and it's inter and transdisciplinary. So with regards to circular food cities, we have, I mean, all the pathways are, are relevant to circularity because this is how they've been built. But the ones that are particularly relevant to circular food cities are of course, our pathway on urban food system transformation, the one on food waste and resource efficiency, one on governance and system change, another one on food systems and data, and we can't forget our food systems Africa because what we're deploying in Europe also has great potential there. 
So each of these pathways, each of these issues are being, are being addressed through a multitude of topics in our uh, work program for 2021 and 2022. And we're building on very close collaboration we've had in, in previous years and even today with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and with a project that we launched and is now finished called Fit for Food 2030, which was a really which really helped us deploy our food 2030 thinking across Europe at city level at regional level and at national level. And just to mention that in Horizon 2020 alone, we supported nine urban food system and, and place-based food system projects for approximately 80 million euros. And Food Trails is one of those successful projects. So we're really, really happy that you know, we've been able to, to play a catalytic role in, in much of this work. And we're determined to take this further under, under Horizon Europe. Just a few words now and, and before I conclude to mention that there's also topics being um, built up re relevant to the bioeconomy strategy where there isn't a particular action that is looking at a topic on urban bioeconomy pilots. So that will enable 10 European cities to turn organic waste from a societal problem into a valuable resource for the production of bio-based products. So it's not just a question of reducing waste, as, as was said um, uh, before by all, but also a question of uh, transforming that unavoidable waste into usable, valuable resources uh, and products and services. So another topic that we're very keen on that is, that is of, of interest here is the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative that will support demonstration projects that implement and demonstrate circular systemic solutions for the deployment of the circular economy, including the bioeconomy in cities and regions and their groupings. And these are of course very relevant also to food systems. We're also um, launching a development assistance to cities and regions and project promoters. And then we are keen to disseminate much of the knowledge and expertise in regions through a platform where visibility is given to these. And last but not least, I'd like to mention also the, um, the BBI, so the Bio-Based Industry Joint Undertaking, this big mechanism that has been running since 2014 and is now going into a second stage where it will be called the Circular Bio-Based Europe Partnership to be launched in 2021, where a number, quite a number of, of, of projects, um, public-private projects um, and initiatives are being, are being channeled and funded and supported to de-risk de them and, and are also relevant to, to how we valorize food waste. Um, to conclude, I'd like to say and reiterate what was said before that cities are key agents of change and ecosystems of innovation in themselves to get things done on the ground. That multi-actor approaches, that inter and transdisciplinarity and systemic solutions are really needed and can deliver co-benefits. And the word design and designers and design innovation and design thinking was, was mentioned before. And this all has to really be at the heart of what we do next. That research and innovation policy and policy more generally can help, but you also need to seek out of synergies with other instruments to help you get this done. That we're also building up what we're calling a Horizon Europe Food Systems Partnership um, that can help. And there's also five new Horizon Europe missions on soil, on health, on climate adaptation, oceans and cities, and on cancer. And all of them are in part, if not fully relevant to helping the food system transition. Uh, I also um, invite you to keep your eyes on further policy developments in relation to the Green Deal, to the Farm to Fork strategy, to the bioeconomy strategy. These are all excellent opportunities and policy framings that, you know, that will drive next steps. I invite you also to join us on the 7th and 8th of July for our Horizon Europe Cluster 6 Info Days in which all of the, all of the issues um, uh, that I mentioned above will be presented and, and there is going to be a Q&A on these where you can obtain more information if you're interested in, in submitting proposals. I'd like to reiterate that the UN Food System Summit um, is really a key milestone, so get involved if you can. The Science Days are happening next week Unfortunately, they're taking place at the same time as our info days on the 7th and 8th of July, and the pre-summit event will be taking place on 26th to 28th of July. So there's lots of things to do, lots of activities, um, side events to be involved in. 
And I invite you also to sign up to our stakeholder list, our Food 2030 stakeholder list, so you can be kept informed. And please also sign up as an evaluator to help us evaluate project proposals. And we need, we need, you know, we just we don't just need um, very mature and experienced experts here. We also need innovators and and young young uh, thought leaders and change makers to help us evaluate proposals that can bring in all these all these new ideas. So happy to have uh, concluded, helped conclude the day for you. And I've I've put many links in the chat so you can you can follow up uh, and happy to connect and, and with you all on further steps. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Karin Fabri, for providing us with precious insights on the catalytic role that the European Union has definitely been playing to support the transition and transformation towards circular food systems and cities through successful programs and R&I policies. Also, very important to mention the UN Food Summit and also for introducing us with the important concept of working towards co-benefit and leveraging the much needed ecosystemic approach we have mentioned uh, several times uh, in this uh, EU circular talk. And now, last but not least, we will have Chiara Nobili introducing the activities of the Italian Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform Working Group on Agri-Food. Please, Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll try to share the screen. Think here. Can you see probably the screen? Yes, best. Okay, thank you. And I would like to thank uh, Paula and their staff and they know for the invitation and the organization of this. Uh, very inspiring, I'd say, event. And I'll say a few words about, about um, the Italian Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, launched in May 2018, that uh, counts a multiplicity of stakeholders um, that are mainly firms and associations, but are also uh, institutions, university and research uh, citizen and third sector. Uh, important uh, organism of this uh, platform is, is, is the Committee for Good Practice Revision that collect, uh, revise good practices uh, and uh, send this to HSP that uh, selects uh, them based on the representativeness, uh, mainly to avoid uh, duplicates. Um, HSP was uh, created uh, uh, mainly to bring together initiative and, and share experiences and light critical issues and indicate perspective um, in order to represent the Italian uh, specific cities in terms of uh, circular economy in Europe and to promote the uh, Italian way for circular economy throughout specific uh, dedicated actions. Um, as um, uh, you can notice the first three purposes, uh, such as promote the knowledge diffusion, create a permanent operational tool um, that uh, can facilitate the intersectoral the dialogue and the interactions and the collection and mapping good practices are in common with the uh, ESSP. Um, the activities are carried out essentially throughout working groups. Uh, um, connected and aware to the issues of greatest importance for the circular economy, uh, to the main priorities and problems that uh, require the evaluation and the intervention solution. As you can see, there is a sort of correspondence among ISIS and ISIS working groups topic, um, whose uh, real added value is the um, let's say the ability to carry out uh, national, international um, communication uh, thanks to the community active stakeholders. Uh, the um, operative instrument of the platform are the sites in which can be found the information, ISIS 
chart, uh, chart rules, uh, good practice uh, database, uh, working groups, discretion, interslateral signature uh, joining um, request, uh, um, a mail address uh, for communication and, and information, and uh, a newborn uh, newsletter for ASISP uh, uh, community. The um, uh, operative uh, instruments uh, um, um, are uh, gathered with uh, other information that we can that can be found uh, about working groups, uh, good practice database, uh, and joining uh, uh, form. Um, uh, ISHASP uh, founded, uh, uh, updated in uh, 2020 the priority intervention areas. Uh, um, for um, an Italian strategic agenda of a circular economy uh, for um, formulating uh, basically proposal for nine, in, nine intervention area that identify systemic themes, uh, tools and uh, actions uh, on which uh, to intervene also for a post-COVID-19 recovery. Uh, that are mainly inspired by the principle of circular models and uh, sustainable growth. Uh, each priority includes five operative proposals that are also presented to Italian ministries. One of the issue uh, on, on, on this issue of operate uh, working groups and sub working groups like those um, that relate to agri-food uh, issues. Um, this uh, sub-working group uh, um, is focused on the prevent prevention and re reduction of uh, waste from the agri-food sector, considered among the priority and strategic ones uh, for the circular economy. This group, uh, in line with the platform participant typologies, sees different types of stakeholders, especially relating to companies and trade association. Uh, this uh, group uh, published last year in ISS website a position paper, uh, focused uh, mail on priorities, guidelines, and best practice uh, uh, relating to the prevention and reduction of food waste uh, from global to national level. And uh, in brief, uh, all um, the phase of food chain were realized, uh, uh, were analyzed, and um, better understand which are um, which are the most crit critical. Then, food waste uh, regulation was uh, investigated with particular attention of Italian one, that is one of the, among the few that uh, regulate the subsidiarity principle. And then, the um, almost sixteen good practices was were. Um, uh, analyzed and collected in order to prevent food waste. The group is also uh, involved in communication and dissemination activity, such as um, participation to public events, workshop, webinar, and is about to publish the scientific paper in the Environmental Engineering and Management Journal uh, titled Circular Economy Good Practices in Waste Management and Prevention in the Food System. Um, to conclude, as I said, uh, the beginning, a very effective tool uh, to understand our system is, in this case, is a food system, is moving and what objectives it sets, uh, um, is represented by good practices that can identify the gaps uh, in the system and propose strategic action to close them. Uh, from the analysis of uh, most 60 good practices collected by ISSP, it emerged that most of the good practices refer to the later stages of the food system. Um, the strategies aims at reducing food waste, uh, relating mainly to develop new technology and materials as input for primary production, um, an, an enormous uh, effort is uh, being made to enhance sustainable agriculture, including precision farming and vertical farming that can be expanded at a thermal level. 
And the second point is uh, sharing food surpluses with uh, needy people. And this become feasible and it is largely encouraged at Italian level thanks to the GADA law that regulates uh, already existing rules and tax concession. Uh, but um, for the more, it's uh, important to say that uh, the recovery and the redistribution of the surpluses for social purposes uh, foster the transition toward the circular economy uh, while improving collaboration between uh, food supply chain uh, uh, stakeholders. And the third point uh, uh, is uh, the reusing and um, enhancing by products for consideration as second raw materials. Uh, the um, recycling of secondary raw materials is uh, uh, then a way to redirect the system towards uh, a circular uh, perspective uh, and that uh, leads to um, decrease the impact uh, of food waste in this case uh, uh, and towards climate neutrality. And let's say that effort must be um, concentrated on the creation of a product designed to last longer, especially in a context characterized by intense use of a short period of time or by a second life immediately following the first. And it's generally accepted that uh, uh, circular economy good practice help manage and prevent waste. So uh, I think that more work needs to be done on prevention within the upstream phase, mainly of the supply chain. Um, to conclude, uh, um, I think that for this assumption is uh, clear that a process of uh, uh, competitive relaunch must start above all in the cities, a place uh, where 80% of all food will be consumed by 2015 and which involved the entire agri-food system. In fact, uh, uh, to meet the growing food needs uh, of the population, increasing concern concentrated in the city, um, since resorts uh, will become very limited over time, um, it's of pivotal importance to foster the production of food by optimizing the use of land, water, and energy. And this is uh, will be the basis of the food challenge and, and uh, that it must start from uh, urban territories. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Chiara Nobili. And thanks a lot to all our excellent speakers and to our audience. I'm afraid we do not have much time to answer all the questions live. But we will make sure to save them and get back to you, definitely. Thanks again to the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform for providing these unique opportunities and outlets for knowledge sharing and engagement with civil society. And now on to Paola De Bernardi for the closing of our EU Circular Talk. Thank you, Simona. I would like to thank all the speakers and participants for contributing uh, with very interesting suggestions, uh, valuable case studies and inspirational best practices to the second uh, uh, European talk. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, for our half an hour delay. And I hope to have uh, future opportunities to uh, meet you all, uh, maybe in person, and to create a beautiful community contributing together with passion and common goals uh, to boost circularity with real action uh, in, in our city. So thank you very much to everyone to be here with us and uh, keep in touch. <laughs>